Hi everyone. Welcome to the new semester. I'm Kate Follette and this is the second lecture for Astronomy 102. So in the first lecture, Maria talked about daily motions in the night sky. And in this lecture, I'd like to talk about yearly motions in the night sky. So to very briefly sum up what Maria talked about last time, here on Earth, we spin on an axis, the Earth's rotational axis, and this takes place once every 24 hours, which we call a day. So the Earth spinning on its axis is the cause of all of the different phenomena that Maria talked about last time, namely rising and setting and daily motions of things in the night sky. Everything I'm going to talk about in this lecture is a consequence of the sun's gravitational influence on the Earth, which causes the Earth to revolve around the sun once every 365 days, which is the period that we call a year. So that's why this is the yearly motions lecture. By the way, we use this term revolution to distinguish this kind of motion from rotational motion. So the Earth spins on its axis once every 24 hours, that's one rotation, and it revolves around the Sun once every 365 days, which is a year. So the first thing that's important to note is that this, is, this time period of 365 days is a coincidence of the Earth's location relative to the Sun. There's nothing special about it, and if we lived on a different planet, there would also be quote-unquote yearly motions but they'd be a different length of time because the sun would have a different gravitational influence on different planets at different locations in the solar system. So if we look at our solar system planets, we can see this. So here's the length of a year in days for all of the planets in the solar system and a few more that I'll talk about. So first, if you look at the column that says Earth, you'll see the length of the year is 365 days. So notice that I've rounded to the nearest day here for most of these. The inner planets in the solar system, Mercury and Venus, have years that are shorter than an Earth year. And things in the outer solar system have longer years. So as a brief aside, notice that I've included some objects that you might not normally think about here. So first of all, in between Mars and Jupiter, there's an object here called Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. So you'll notice that when you look at the way um, the length of the year progresses from Mercury out to the outer solar system, there are some jumps here. And in particular, there's a really large jump between Mars and Jupiter, which is what you usually think about as being the next planet out. But there's actually a bunch of stuff in between Mars and Jupiter, um, thousands of asteroids, and Ceres is the largest of those, so I've just put that in here as a placeholder. Later in the semester, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about why there is such a big gap there. You'll also notice that at the very end, I've listed yearly motions for a couple of extrasolar planets. So this is my research area, and so you might hear me talking about these a little bit over the course of this semester. It's kind of one of my favorite types of example. So these are two very famous extrasolar planets. And by the way, extrasolar planet means a planet around a star other than our sun. So we know of thousands of these now. And the very first one that was discovered was this planet called 51 Pegasus b. And it has an orbital period or a year of 4.23 days. Another planet that was found relatively recently in 2010 with the pretty um, uncreative name of HR 8799b has an orbital period or a year of 170,000 days. So one thing I wanted to make a point of here right away is that the planets in our solar system may or may not be typical of the universe, of the kind of planets that the universe creates. So we find lots and lots of planets around other stars these days, and they may or may not be similar to planets in our own solar system. Some of them, like 51 Pegasus b, which has a really, really, really short year, are hard to explain, 
And others like HR 8799B, which have a really, really, really long year, are also hard to explain. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the semester. The other thing that you'll notice here is that I've added a column that says length of the year scaled in Earth years. So all of the numbers in this first column here are very specific. And one beauty of astronomy um, is that we don't often care about very specific numbers. And we like to put things in context. So sometimes we're dealing with very large numbers, and it's hard to even imagine what they could mean relative to what we're used to here on Earth. So we use this technique called scale modeling often to put numbers into context. So this third column here is basically just saying if you scaled all of these planets, the, the length of the year on all of these planets, to the length of a year on Earth, how would they compare? And I'm going to leave that for an exercise to be done in class, but it's an interesting thing to think about, right? How does 170,000 days compare to 365? Although the length of the year might vary drastically from planet to planet, the basic consequences of yearly motion on the night sky of these planets is pretty similar. So what are the consequences of Earth's revolution around the Sun in terms of what we see in the night sky over the course of the year? So one way to look at this is to think about a certain constellation. So let's start with my favorite constellation, which is Orion. Orion's a really interesting constellation and a very easy one to pick out in the night sky because of this distinctive shape. In particular, you should look for two, two very, very bright stars here. So Orion is an archer, and you can see here, um, this is, this is, these are his shoulders, and these are his feet down here. This is Orion's belt and his sword, and because he's an archer, he has an arm extending with a bow over here. So two things that you could look for um, to help find Orion are the three stars that line up to form his belt right here, um, and these two very bright stars named Betelgeuse and Rigel. So Betelgeuse is Orion's right shoulder, and his left foot is Rigel. So... Orion's my favorite constellation, but I can't see it in the night sky all year. In fact, Orion is called a winter constellation, which means that it's visible in the early evening during the winter. So the first consequence of yearly motion, in terms of what we see in the night sky, is that we don't always see the same set of stars over the course of the year. Yes, stars rise and set over the course of a day due to the Earth's rotation on its axis, but the stars that are rising and setting on any given day also change over the course of a year, and that's a consequence of the Earth's revolution around the Sun. So here's one way to think about those yearly motions of the constellations. The reason why we can't see Orion on any given day of the year, or any other constellation, the reason why we can only see them during certain seasons, is essentially because of what's shown in this picture. So what we're seeing here is sort of a zoomed out view, a cartoon picture of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, but in this case it's showing all of the stars in the sky that kind of line up with the plane of the Earth and the Sun. So if you drew a line directly from the Earth to the Sun, what constellation would be in the background? That's the yellow arrow that you see there. So if you look at the Earth in this picture, you'll notice there's a daytime side, there's a lit side, and there's a nighttime side. So remember, the Earth is orbiting on its, its axis, this blue line shown in the figure, and pieces of it are passing from the daytime side to the nighttime side. Right? So during the daytime, we can't see any stars simply as a consequence of the Earth's atmosphere um, 
scattering blue light and washing it out so that we can't see the stars. So we have to be on the nighttime side to see stars. And as you can see, only some of them line up with the nighttime side of the Earth. So everything, sort of the back half of this diagram, all of the stars over there, the sun and the Earth's atmosphere are in the way. The daytime sky is in the way of seeing those constellations on any given day. And the back side, the side that's closest to us, these are all constellations that are oriented away from the sun relative to where the Earth is right now. So these are the ones that are going to be visible in the nighttime. So this changes, obviously, over the course of the year because the Earth's not always going to be in this location relative to the sun. So how does it change over the course of the year? How much does the sun move against background stars over the course of a year and over the course of a day? Well, if one year, one orbit around the sun is 365 days, an orbit is a circle, and so the sun moves 360 degrees around the Earth from our perspective, right? Remember always that the Earth is the thing that's moving, not the sun. But it wasn't silly that ancient people thought that the sun orbited around the Earth because it does appear that way from our perspective, right? It's all relative. So the sun, from our perspective, makes a 360 degree circle around the sky, a full circle, over the course of a year. So how much does it move then over the course of the day? Well, we have two numbers here. So if it moves 365 days, in 365 days, if it moves 360 degrees, how much does it move per day? So a lot of people would just run to their calculator to, to figure this out. But in astronomy, as I was mentioning before, we often don't care about super precise numbers. We do a lot of what we call order of magnitude estimation. So an astronomer will look at two numbers like this and they'll say 365, that's really not very different from 360. So a good approximation is that the sun moves about one degree per day, right? If you divide 360 degrees by 365 days, those are approximately equal to each other. So you essentially have 360 over 360 and you get one degree per day. So let's take a different view of what this path that the sun takes across the sky looks like. So see this red line in the diagram is all of the constellations that line up with the earth and the sun. If you draw a line directly from the earth to the sun every single day for 365 days, you can see it'll trace out this red path across the sky. So if we look at that from our perspective, um, in a flat map, this is what we see. So this green line is that path. And you can see the constellations along that path are all labeled here. So from left to right, if you look at them carefully, they might kind of stand out to you as something that you recognize. So this path, this green path, is called the ecliptic. So this is just a vocabulary word that you should learn. So the ecliptic is just the path that the sun traces through the constellations over the course of a year. So it takes the sun 365 days, moving at about one degree per day, to complete this entire path that's shown here. And if you look at the constellations labeled along it, you might recognize them as the signs of the zodiac. So from left to right, they go Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and then back to Pisces. So these are what we call the zodiacal constellations. And as you learned in the first lab, the, your zodiac sign is the location of the sun relative to the background stars on the day that you were born. So this is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object, which is a classic problem in mapping, not just the night sky, but the Earth. 
So if we want to understand why the ecliptic on this map has a curved path, um, we're going to have to take a 3D view again. So let's review what this looks like in the 3D view, this time just looking at the zodiacal constellations. So the first thing you'll notice here is that the Earth is pictured at 12 different positions, about one per month. And coincidentally, there are about 12 zodiacal constellations. This is actually um, sort of a historical anomaly. There are 13 zodiacal constellations, and one of them has been skipped. And one of the reasons that there are 12 instead of 13, that they've been ignored this 13th constellation, which is called Ophiuchus, um, is so that they'd have one per month. You guys kind of explored this in your lab, so I won't go into too much detail about it. But we could also talk about it in class if you have any further questions. So the Earth is pictured in its orbit around the Sun here at 12 different positions, and if we label them with their dates, you can see that from this perspective, the Earth is orbiting the Sun counterclockwise. So at any given one of these dates, if you wanted to know which zodiacal constellation corresponded to that date, you could use this as a map to figure it out. And the way that you do that is you just draw a line from the Earth on that date through the Sun and project it all the way out to the zodiacal constellations. So the line connecting the Earth and the Sun will tell you what constellation the Sun is in on that date. So for February 21st, the line looks like this, and it points towards the constellation Aquarius. So if we did this for each of these points labeled along the Earth's orbit, we could label um, the zodiacal constellations with dates as well. And this means the date that the Sun is in this constellation. So it's opposite the Earth just as a consequence of the fact that what we're doing here is we're projecting the line from the, from the Earth to the Sun to the background constellation. So they're on opposite sides of the circle. But again, they progress counterclockwise here. So two months from this date, the Earth, it'll be April 21st, and the Earth will have moved about two months worth in its orbit. So if a month's about 30 days um, and it's moved two months and the Earth, the Sun moves about a degree a day relative to the background stars, that means that the Sun will have moved 60 degrees across the sky over the course of those two months and it'll be in a completely different constellation on April 21st. That constellation just happens to be Aries. So let's go back here to our two-dimensional map of the night sky. So I said we were going to talk about why the yellow line was curved in this diagram. And we're getting there, but the first thing that we need to do is to talk about why it's offset from the blue line that goes straight across this diagram. So again, the yellow line is the path of the ecliptic. It has the zodiacal constellations along it. And this blue line is what we call the celestial equator. So what does that mean? To picture what it means, you have to kind of take an, a 3D view, or that helps. So here's, here's a more 3D picture. So you see the Earth here, and the white line around the middle of it is the Earth's equator. If you projected the Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere, so just as a reminder, Maria talked about the celestial sphere in the last lecture, and what it is is just kind of a a star globe. So it's a conceptualization, it's not what the real universe looks like, but from the perspective of the Earth you could imagine collapsing all of the stars onto a sphere um, and mapping their locations out relative to the Earth. If you did that then the and you extended the plane of the Earth's equator all the way out to the celestial sphere the place where they intersect or the line where they intersect would be the celestial equator. So in the top diagram, the two-dimensional view of the Earth's sky, all of the constellations that lie along the blue line are constellations that line up with the plane of the Earth's equator. And the, the yellow line are constellations that line up with the Earth-Sun plane. That's pictured in the diagram on the bottom right as the yellow shaded area. 
you can see that the sun is, is orbiting along the outside of that yellow plane, um, and that the yellow plane and the blue plane don't match up. So if you, if you look carefully at the figure, you'll actually see that in the middle on the right, there's actually a label showing how much they're offset by, which is 23 and a half degrees. And if that number sounds familiar, it's because that's the amount that the Earth's axis is tilted. So a tilt really only means something relative to something else, and that's where these two planes come in. So the way that the solar system formed means that the Earth's axis was probably initially exactly perpendicular to the ecliptic. So if you do a plane through the Earth-Sun system, the Earth's rotational axis would have been exactly perpendicular or 90 degrees away from that. But something happened in the early solar system that caused the Earth's rotational axis to be offset from the ecliptic. So by 23 and a half degrees from this line that's exactly perpendicular to the ecliptic. So since the Earth's equator is relative to the rotational axis, that's, and the celestial equator is an extension of the Earth's equator, this is essentially the reason that these two planes don't line up. So relative to this cartoon picture um, that I just drew and the diagram we were looking at before, in order to line them up, we actually have to rotate the figure that I've made here. So let's do that. So the plane of the ecliptic and the plane of the celestial equator are the same between the left and, and the right diagrams here. And this essentially shows why they don't line up. They don't line up because the Earth's axis is tilted relative to the plane of the ecliptic. Of course, the Earth and the Sun are not the only objects in our solar system. So the next question we might ask is, other than stars lining up with the plane of the Earth and the Sun, or the plane of the Earth's equator, where do other objects show up? Well, let's start with just the planets in our own solar system and ask the question of whether they line up with either of these planes we've been talking about, either the plane of the ecliptic or the plane of the celestial equator. So to give away the answer, they line up along the plane of the ecliptic and there's a reason for that. So if we do another cartoon picture, this time of different planets in the solar system. In this case, I've just shown Mars and Jupiter relative to Earth. So if the Earth's orbit around the sun is this um, blue shaded region. And I should point out that this is elliptical only because we're looking at it kind of from an angle here. So we're imagining looking at planes from an angle, in which case they look a little elliptical. Again, like I said before, the Earth's orbit around the Sun is actually almost perfectly circular, and that's true of these other two planets as well. Um, but if you looked at it from the side, it would appear a little bit elliptical. So if you drew a plane for Mars's ecliptic, or the plane connecting Mars and the Sun, and you drew a plane for Jupiter's ecliptic, or the plane connecting Jupiter and the Sun, Jupiter's ecliptic, Mars's ecliptic, and Earth's ecliptic would all line up. All that's really saying is that the planets in our solar system all lie in the same plane, and that plane is the same as the plane, um, is the plane that the sun lives in. So all of the planets and the sun in our solar system lie in the same plane. And that's a consequence, an interesting consequence actually, of the way that the solar system formed around the sun. All of the leftover material after the sun's formation collapsed to form this flat pancake-like disk of material that makes up all of the planets, that made up all of the planets as they formed. So to go back to our, our questions here, <clears throat> um, we asked why was the yellow line of the ecliptic offset from the blue line? And why was the yellow line curved? Well, this is just a consequence of mapping, and that's why, um, that's why three-dimensional representations are sometimes needed to understand these things. 
So again, the reason they're offset is just because of the tilt of the Earth's axis. That's why the blue line and the yellow line don't line up. And the reason the yellow line appears to be curved is because um, we've chosen the celestial equator as the reference point here. Um, and when you try and collapse the three-dimensional celestial sphere onto a two-dimensional map, any other straight line along the celestial sphere will appear as a curve. So we'll investigate this a little bit more in one of the labs. But to sum up, the Earth's axis is tilted by 23 and a half degrees, and that's the cause of the offset. And the ecliptic is actually the plane of our solar system. So the celestial equator is an extension of the plane created by the Earth's equator, and the ecliptic is the plane that connects the Earth and the Sun and all the other planets in our solar system. One interesting observational consequence of this is something called the zodiacal light. So here's a picture of what the zodiacal light looks like. And the reason that I've shown it here in a picture where you also see the Milky Way is because they're often confused. So we haven't talked yet about the Milky, what the Milky Way is, um, but to give you just a really brief teaser, because we'll talk about it much more later in the semester, the Milky Way is the plane of the galaxy, of our galaxy. So we, um, on Earth and in our solar system, live in a galaxy of, of hundreds of millions of stars. And the plane of that galaxy, the galaxy that we live in, formed a lot like the solar system did in that um, it's sort of pancake flat. Not quite as flat as a pancake or a piece of paper, but, but fairly flat. And so if you imagine living in the pancake and looking along the direction of the batter, you would, have, you would see lots of things in your way if you were trying to look towards the center of the pancake and you lived towards the outside of the pancake. But if you looked perpendicular, like in the direction of the griddle, um, you would not see very much batter. But in any case, the Milky Way is hundreds of millions of stars in the plane of our galaxy, and the zodiacal light is material that's left over from the formation of our solar system. So I said that the zodiacal constellations lie along the ecliptic, and the ecliptic is the plane of our solar system. So as planets formed in the early solar system, they collided, objects collided, rocky and icy bodies that made up what became the planets in our solar system collided, and they generated lots of fine dust. And that dust permeates our solar system and it scatters or reflects sunlight. So the plane of our solar system we can see sometimes at night just as this faint white um, light, off, kind of like the Milky Way, um, but offset from the Milky Way. You should look for them both in the night sky. And remember that when you're seeing the zodiacal light, what you're really seeing is the path, is the plane of our solar system and all of the leftover material from the formation of the planets in our solar system. So next time we'll be talking about consequences of the Earth's axial tilt. We talked a little bit about um, what it means relative to the ecliptic this time, but we'll talk about what it means relative to seasons in the next lecture.